All right, I'm Dave Ratt, and today I want to talk about time and latency. Um, in the last video, when I was testing this Behringer X32 against this Yamaha CL1, I found that the CL1 had a differing latency depending on how you routed signals through it. Um, if you go into the console and out of the console, it shows about two milliseconds of latency. But if you go through a subgroup and then out of the console, it adds another 150 microseconds or about 0.15 milliseconds. And if you go out of this into a subgroup and out of the subgroup into left and right and then out of the console, it adds another 0.15 milliseconds. So you got uh, 0.3 milliseconds. So there's this cumulative latency as you bus to various places. Um, as long as you're very careful or and follow reasonable paths where you're not resumming the same signal with itself. Um, these latency shifts are very small and are not going to be an issue. On the other hand, it's not that hard to screw up or to have something that takes multiple paths to the console. As far as how audible that is, um, let's give a listen. So I've got some music here that I will start. And I'm going to put headphones on. And um, I've got a really high-tech switch here. I've got my switcher hooked up somewhere else. I don't want to rewire. So what I've got is just these two XLRs that are plugged into this little mixer here. If I plug in, if I solo here and I solo here, we can listen to the X32 with music going, and it's actually doing six A to D and D to A flips. It goes into channel one, out group one, into two, blah, blah, blah. It goes all the way through. And, uh, but we're listening to a single signal path. Um, and we can compare that one to six as well. So this will be the X32. And this is with six. Probably don't hear any difference there, um, not with this music at least. Um, now let's go over and check out the Yamaha. So I'm going to switch over to the two. And you can hear a little phasing shift because they have different latencies there. And we have six. Ah. Everything sounds like it's working just fine. Now what we'll do is let's go ahead and listen to um, I'm going to turn down the music here on the recorder and let's listen to the left and right here. So now this is the left and right of the X32 and this is double bust. So I've got um, it going from the sixth channel into sent directly to left and right and I've got it from the sixth channel sent to the subgroups and then going to left and right. Um, so it's going through one extra step. It's not going through multiple times. It's just going through passing through the group. Now we can compare those two. So let's go ahead and that's You should just hear a boost in volume, but not a change in the tonal sound of the music because there is a little or no latency differential between those some signals traveling different paths that are resummed together. Let's do that same test on the CL. So now we're on number six. You should be able to hear it. There's a level difference of the double bust 
and maybe not the best um, demonstration there because I haven't matched everything, but you should readily be able to hear the phasing issue, kind of the swirling sound, the darker sound of the music when it was running through the group and resummed with a signal that was sent straight to left and right and not run through the group. That's what that latency shift of 150 milliseconds sounds like. Um, definitely not an inaudible. It's definitely an audible um, concern. So do not run multiple paths on a console that has increased latency as you route differently. As I was looking at all this and testing it, um, I started to wonder or ponder the question, is latency a form of distortion? On an analog console, when you run a signal into it, and then it goes all the way through and comes out, and it's or an amplifier or just a, with no EQ, it just passes straight through, what comes out is very close to what went in. Um, with analog compressors, the same thing, and with digital compressors that are time-aligned latency-wise, with no latency shift, there's things like parallel compression, where you might have a signal that is run multiple paths and then resummed with itself. Um, that only works, those parallel compression, that parallel compression concept and running things down multiple paths, if the time of the two signals being resummed is not offset. Um, once the signal has been offset, it's very difficult to get it set back in place unless you can exactly reverse that time. Um, is that a form of distortion? Is the fact that we ran through a digital console and our in-ears are a little late, a millisecond late, compared to what we normally hear, and we cannot delay our voice, that lateness is, is fixed, it's, it's embedded. It becomes part of the signal. Um, is that a distortion? Um, in order to determine something like that, you know, we, like with anything in life, you have to um, look at the definition of the word or what you're talking about, define it, and also look at your perspective. Uh, so, you know, define your perspective of, um, and your viewpoint. If typically audio distortion is considered a deformation or deformation of the waveform, something that has altered it, it's clipped it, or, um, you know, Dolby, for example, would distort the waveform, deform it, run it through a recording process, and then undeform it, and then undistort it, and put it back to its original shape allegedly or hopefully. Um, as far as deformation of the waveform, shifting it in time does not necessarily do that. The waveform is, with a perfect latency, um, not really a deformation. It's just a shift in time. On the other hand, if we look at a signal and we're looking at this at this point in time and we have two signals that are out of time, it will appear deformed. It is a different signal at that at any point in time. That's with audio. With other things like um, uh, just time distortion. If we look at time warpage, or you know the way gravity alters time, or speed, velocity. You know Einstein and the the change in uh, higher velocities warp or distort time. Um, in that context, we do accept typically that time does get dis time is a form of distortion, or time can be distorted, and a distorted time frame could be an uh, a form of dis. You might be able to make that connection from that perspective. Um, EQ that's a form of distortion. We're altering the waveform. Um, clipping. Uh, compress compression, gates, limiters, those are all forms of distortion. Um, so then I guess we got to decide whether or not it is something is desirable or undesirable. We're going to uh, put things into two piles. Is it, a, uh, is it a desirable thing that it's not distortion, it's an intended 
outcome. And if it's undesirable and not easily, easily reversed, um, then it is a form of distortion, I guess, or a perspective could be. Um, is it optional or is it unavoidable? Uh, if it's optional, maybe it's not a distortion. And if it's unavoidable, then maybe it is a distortion. Um, you know, putting something onto, or making a recording and putting it onto a MP3, in MP3 and playing it back later, or recording it in WAV format and playing it back later, there is a shift in time, but that's an optional shift in time. Latency through a console or through digital processing is not necessarily an optional. It's something that can be minimized, but not eliminated. So maybe in that context, um, it could be viewed as a distortion. And I guess I'm kind of laying in this distortion thing is I believe that if you've watched a bunch of my videos and you look at other stuff that I've done, I do keep revisiting the concept of latency um, as an underestimated or overlooked or um, kind of pushing that to the forefront of importance because um, it does create numerous issues. And um, especially the video I did or the, you know, uh, seminars and stuff where I talk about, um, you know, what is natural and um, unnatural and natural sounds. And, you know, nowhere in nature does the exact same sound radiate from multiple points in space. And yet we do that in live audio all the time. And when you have the same sound radiating from multiple points in space, then you have issues with time or latency, um, polarity, phase, and distance. You know, you have all these things. Well, that concept applies not only in the real world, but also inside of a console. If you have a signal that is passing through in a singular thread through a piece of electronic gear and comes out all good. But if you have it divided, so now you have two identical or similar versions of that same signal. Now you're looking at complexities and possible issues. Um, not always undesirable, but can often be undesirable. Um, it's important to know that latency or time delays, they're responsible and polarity that's responsible for a lot of what we do that's desirable in um, live audio reinforcement. Uh, line arrays work on having the same exact signal come out of multiple points in space at specific placements in space such that they sum more in some areas and not as much in others and it gives us the directivity and the throw of line arrays. Um, Subwoofer cardioid arrays, out of polarity and time delay gives us the ability to control the direction of the signal and cancel out and create um, uh, rejection areas. Um, cardioid mics rely on multiple signal paths. There's uh, phase shifters. It's just uh, on and on um, things that we do to benefit from that. And also many issues we face like... Um, you know, comb filtering issues and um, big uh, power alley where the mix position is and then big nulls and places where the sound isn't covering due to cancellations. All of these have to do with the same signal covering the same place with offsets in time, distance, polarity, and phase. Latency has a cost, or maybe not a cost, but a devaluation with enough time we can make a signal more and more perfect. In the very limited amount of time, it gets tougher and tougher to have a flawless signal. Um, with enough time, we could theoretically take multiple samples of the original signal and look at it from multiple angles with multiple pieces of gear and then take the outcome and then compare those all to the original and then have you know, multiple processing, we could actually listen to it and revise it and listen to it again and keep tuning it until it sounds as close to the original as possible after the review point. In fact, we could even maybe make it better than the original. Maybe that's the whole concept of recording albums. You have a band that rehearsed live and you come up with an album that sounds quote unquote better by the perception of the people that are making the album 
than the original. With enough time, we can make signals amazing, but in very limited amounts of time, it's very difficult to do so. And once we've added time to it, we cannot get it back. We cannot undelay a delayed signal. So as long as we're traveling distances with the propagated signal, if we have um, a guitar player playing out of an amp and then we have a speaker that's gonna pick that up and the time it travels, sound travels from the guitar speaker to the speaker and then acts as a delay or the main PA to the delay clusters or subwoofers in a subwoofer array, as long as they can be um, added together, as long as we have enough distance between them, the digital processing latencies can be insignificant. Uh, when we start to deal with things on a very small scale, like in-ears, um, where we're used to hearing our voice at a certain distance, unless the latency can be reduced to lower or equal to the distance the time that it takes sound to leave your mouth and travel to your ear, then we've got some, we've introduced a latency that cannot be regained or recouped. Um, yeah, I think um, just kind of shining the flashlight on latency as a, um, something to think about and pay attention to and the importance and annoying and beauty of being able to shift things in time and watch how they work together. Cool, cool. And I'm going to do some more testing in a little while and um, see what other gremlins I can find. All right. Thanks for joining.